Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, my last episode, I talked about my obsession with creativity. And I'm always thrilled when I find like a fellow traveler who is at least as crazy about creating as I am. So that's why I'm really excited about today's guest. She's all about creating, creating businesses, stories, products, books, podcasts, you name it, she's done it. And now she creates mischief and disruption in marketing. And we'll get into that a little bit because I really want to know what that's about too. So I can't wait to learn how she does this from the founder of mommyloves.com, the CEO and founder of Messenger Funnels, the conversational educator at Bot Academy, multi-talented and clearly extremely busy, Mary Catherine Johnson, MK. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Thank you, Dan. That was so sweet. Oh my gosh. You're just taking me down memory lane. Yeah. Too many things. You did some research there. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on a fence about the research thing. Mm -hmm. Not that I think it's problematic. It's just a time issue, right? Yeah. And you're a podcaster. You know, you've spoken with far more people than I have. And, you know, I should mention that MK has been a speaker at Social Media Marketing World. When you draw the intersection of some of the social media personalities and the marketing personalities on your go on LinkedIn and you start searching around, you'll see that's her second degree. That's that's your her first degrees. So we're talking serious kind of social media marketing royalty, I suppose. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to get a crown out here pretty soon. Yeah. The research is cursory. You can easily find this because Mommy Loves was my very first business that I started in 2003. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that basically grabbed me by the throat and would not let go. I just had no choice. I had to do this. I was absolutely and pulled. And I'm so glad I did because it started me down this whole path of online entrepreneurship. And I haven't looked back since. And now I've got two sons who are also on the, that same path, making their own life. So I'm having a blast. And really, mommy does love. She does. It was so fun. That was the whole thing. I broke both my legs when I was eight months pregnant with my second son. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's my book. That's the, that's the only book I've written. You don't need to go find it. I'll just tell you the story. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did. I was walking out my neighbor's front door and I was eight months pregnant, big, huge baby hotel in front of me. And I had uh, three kids going out the door right around me, running around ages three, four, and five. And uh, of course, they don't wait for some old pregnant lady and took a step down from the door jam there from the rise of the, and stepped down onto the porch. And uh, that was unusually deep step. You know, normal steps are like seven inches. This was like nine and a half. So you go to step thinking it's going to be there and it's not. <laughs> and so I, I go down and I step wrong on one side, kind of step on the side of it. And I go to catch myself and I step on the side of the other one and I heard a little pop. And I proceeded to just roll like a weeble wobble all the way down the three remaining steps and landed with uh, two broken legs. So yeah, land plenty padding. The baby was totally fine. But uh, yeah, that was my journey into, okay, woman, calm down, slow down. You're going, you know, 90 miles an hour and you need to slow down. And that made me slow down. I had no choice. That was your wake up call. I couldn't do anything. Yeah, it was my second wake up call. The first one was the first pregnancy, which where I had, I was actually in early labor. I was in the hospital for a week to stop labor. And that was the first wake up call, but I didn't listen. Uh, the second one was, okay, now I'm breaking something. You're going to listen. <laughs> and I went, okay. And I was depressed for the first time in my entire life I've ever been depressed. I'd had no clue what that meant when people would say I'm depressed. I just wasn't part of my psyche. And this was like, you can't move. You can't take a shower. You can't take a bath. You can't wash your hair. You can't stand by the sink long enough to do dishes. You can't go grocery shopping. You can't do laundry. I can't do any of the normal things that I do. I have to sit and do nothing and let everyone else care for me, which was not just foreign. It was absolutely unnatural. It did not feel good. It's not who I am. And that was like, I don't know what to do. And the only thing that snapped me out was my three-year-old when he looked at me one day and, you know, mommy, come play cars with me because I always did that. And I looked at, and I snapped at him like, what are you talking about? Look at me. Do you think I could play cars with you? What are you? And the look on his face that was my snap. That was like, okay, woman, you better get your stuff together because otherwise you're going to get stuck like this. Well, it's the kind of wake up call we we definitely need to be listening to, you know, and, and all this because I was simply mentioning that I don't like to do research. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> See, we can go on forever and ever. Watch out. Anyone listening? I have a very good feeling about this conversation. I mean, some of the podcasters out there say that it's really important to dig into your topic, into your subject, you know, deeply. I mean, obviously, first of all, there's a lot of time and you're talking to a prize winning author and you really do want to cover some of the books maybe, but you know, Larry King had it right. I really don't do anything either. I mean, I really don't do any research at all in my podcasts because usually I know who they are. Yeah, that's true. I've either invited them or they've been recommended to me or something like that. So I just don't, I just turn on the microphone, say, okay, how should I introduce you? And then we go and I discover as I go. That's kind of what we're doing here. You know, I always tell my listeners how I came across my wonderful guests and you and I met just a few weeks ago on the uprising. Now I know for certain that we were at least geographically in the same places a couple of times, you know, at social media marketing world in 2019 and 2020 at least. So I wouldn't doubt that I'd seen it in line or, you know, whatever. There's 5,000 people at that joint. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fun, but, you know, we can be forgiven for not having made closer connections then. But at the uprising, and, you know, listeners, I've certainly mentioned Mark Schaefer before because, you know, we're serious Mark Schaefer devotees, uh, you know, on this on this show. And Mark has been a great influence, a terrific uh, counsel whenever I've asked him. And, you know, certainly at Social Media Working World, he opened up his... I guess his circle a little bit and just let me in. Like no questions asked. I was just some guy standing around, you know, and I was like, you're Mark Schaefer. And we just started talking. Maybe because I'm sort of in a slightly uh, older demographic than most of social media marketing worlds. We, you know, stand out a little. Yeah, same here. Yeah, but no, we, we just hit it off. And, you know, the uprising, I would call it like an anti-conference. It was like nothing I've ever experienced, really. Uh, it was very intimate. It was very action oriented. I mean, it, you know, whenever a speaker talked, we we would go into breakout sessions of, of very small numbers, like three or four people at the most, and talk about what was going on and how we applied it. And then when we came back, it wasn't just to kind of, yeah, yeah, go on to the next thing. It was really like, no, tell us what you thought. And everybody got a chance to say, well, you know, so-and-so said this and so-and-so gave me this idea and I never thought about it. And it was a completely collaborative experience. And yeah, totally. I've never been to a conference like that. Only 40 people. You know, Mark is careful about who he invites and, uh, you know, to a degree. Uh, and his speakers are fantastic. But, you know, what, what I love about it is you go to these little breakouts and you come back to that main room and, you know, at a normal, so to speak, conference or at a, at a work workshop or something like this, you come back and you report in, right? There's this kind of group one, what did you do? Oh, where's, let, let me see your flip chart. And that's useful. But the way that Mark organized this is, you know, he said, okay, who wants to start with the feedback? And there's a few folks who are now getting to be sort of regulars, even though this was only the second or third one. But, you know, so-and-so would, would raise their hand and say, well, you know, in my room, uh, we talked about this, but really I got this great wisdom from Dan. Dan, can you just talk about that? And then they just hand over the baton and Mark was tracking, you know, like he made sure everybody felt uh, appreciated and listened to. And you don't get that at, at most conferences and the stuff that you're coming up with at these things. Like, I mean, it's really high level, but I have, I'll tell you what, from this one, MK, I don't know if you remember this part, but no less than five times have I brought up the E to B to B to B. C. Uh, is that right? E to B to B to C. Am I missing a B? I think that was it. No, I think there's only two. That was from Minter Dial, right? Yeah. Employee to business to business to consumer, you know, describing the, I suppose, the, the marketing. Yeah. The conversation, the purpose all the way. It starts with a business, but it has to include the employee, the business, the business they sell to and the customer. No such thing as B to B or B to C anymore. It's E to B to B to C. I said it like a dozen times and I can't remember how many Bs there are. What, what was your takeaway from that? Was there anything like in particular stood out to you? It really was just the environment, the camaraderie. If you asked me all the details of what I learned and how I did things, I've already incorporated them to the extent that I don't remember exactly where they came from because it was so intimate in that respect. I've got tons of notes and uh, it allowed me to take all kinds of notes and, and pay attention in a way that was very different because like social media marketing world, really, to be honest, most of the conversations happen out in the hallways. Yeah. So many, many times I have an intention to go watch a certain speaker or do a certain thing. I stop in the hallway and, and see somebody I know or see something that, you know, somebody comes up to me or something and we have a conversation. I don't even get to the to this big particular, you know, presentation that I wanted to to get to. There's no opportunity to do that here because it really is that intimate and that specific. And uh, we're here for a purpose. 
And we go into that purpose and the, you know, the ability for people to just hand over the mic like that takes a, you know, a, a squash of your ego, you know, and, and, and understanding that you don't need to feed your ego and make yourself stand out in this environment. You can help your fellow attendee if you really did think something was amazing. Why not let them shine? It's designed, I think, to quash like imposter syndrome and, you know, make everybody feel good and shine. I think that's, that's a good way to think about it. I think I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, because there's a lot of stuff going on. You have the, mm-hmm. you have the, uh, the, the room, so to speak, of this is a Zoom thing, right? So, you know, you can picture the Zoom, Hollywood Squares, but, you know, extended. And you've got all these people talking and whoever the speaker is and, and who's, who's now just a participant. Once you're back in the room, the, the speaker is just a participant, just like everybody else, which is awesome. And then you have this chat going on, this really vibrant and incredible chat. I think there was something that in the chat, it was probably during Minter Dial's thing where we were talking about E to B to B to C situation. And somebody mentioned about, about marketing being conversations. And that might've been you. I certainly recall that, that you were involved in this part of the chat and marketing being a conversation. And I was like, holy shit, that's the clue train. Back to the clue train manifesto before 99, right? It was like, was it 99? I don't know. Marketing is a conversation. Now you are the, a conversational educator, right? So clearly marketing as a conversation is part of who you are and what you do. So I wonder know what you think about that. Like, how did you get there? How did you get to this point where you learned or knew that, that the conversation is the thing? I think coming out of college, my first job, if you can believe it, I have a degree in nutrition and food science from UC Berkeley. I wanted to be a dietitian. Actually, I wanted to be a doctor, but I got a real rude awakening with that at, at Berkeley that uh, basically cured me of that desire. To be honest, I could tell you all kinds of stories. That sounds like I'm just writing that down as a side note for another podcast with MK. <laughs> yeah, it was an eye-opening experience. But coming out, I had definitely wanted to, to study nutrition and I wanted to be a dietitian. I came out and thought, you know, I, I don't want to work in a hospital prescribing diets to cancer patients. That's not what I want to do. I want to educate. I went and actually got a job at Jenny Craig Weight Loss Center. And they had an incredible sales training. Incredible. They opened my eyes more than any education I had at Berkeley to how to communicate to people and how to ask questions and listen and gather data, gather information from people, and then not spit it back, but paraphrase it to say, okay, what I hear you saying is this, is that correct? And they would say yes or no. And we would clarify again and get down to the point where does this program work for you or doesn't it? And it isn't trying to sell somebody something that doesn't work. It's asking questions to get them to that point to see if it does. And if it doesn't, great, go have a nice life. Bye-bye. If it does, then let's find a way we can do it. So that conversation right there opened my eyes to all of that. And then we go through to staffing right? Staffing is all about conversations. You have to interview both the employer to try and find out what they need and the employee to see if they're a fit, right? So it's all about seeing if there's a fit. Again, same concept, only I have now two clients, (laughs) right? The employer and the employee. So going fast forward from that to now with my own business with Mommy Loves, but then that was going amazingly well until 2008, right? It was retail online that crashed and burned. And Now going into this marketing conversation with uh, actually chatbots. That's the first introduction specifically into marketing that I had. And it just, it was another one of those things. I played around and, you know, had my ego bruised and felt uh, totally imposter when 2008 hit thinking, oh, maybe I'm not cut out for this, all that kind of baloney. And finally, 2017, I got an email from one of my favorite podcasters, Andrew Warner, and he has Mixergy, where he interviews uh, tech guys and gals, mostly guys, who start, have all kinds of tech startups. He's a brilliant interviewer. He just uh, published a book called Stop Asking Questions, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's about how to interview people. I love his interview style. He can get, he is so approachable and, and kind, and you just feel so comfortable around him, but he gets things out of people that they don't want to say. (laughs) <laughs> and so, you know, I, I got an email from him because I was on his list because I love listening to a show. And he says, how would you like 80% open rates and uh, 60% click-through rates? And of course I was doing like membership sites for people and doing all kinds of things. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like that. He says, I'm doing a webinar. Join me. Of course, we all know webinars, right? It's going to try and sell me something. So usually I don't 
I sign up for webinars, but I usually never attend them live. I watch the replay. Yeah. But this one, for some reason, something was going on. Serendipity, I know, where I showed up live. He actually did a demo of building a chatbot. He was basically starting a course called Bot Academy. It was the very first cohort of Bot Academy back in January of 2017. And uh, I raised my hand and went, oh my goodness. Again, I was grabbed by the throat again. And basically the culmination of everything I've done, completely everything I've done in my professional career came to uh, a head and it all made sense. It was like this is having conversations with people to help them decide whether or not they want something. And I can do this for clients. I can actually, I don't care who they are, I can help create these conversations so that they can have, uh, they can deepen the know, like, and trust faster with their prospects than anything else. Long story short, he was offering a $400, you had to put down a $400 deposit to get on a call with him to see if you qualified for this course. And uh, so I'm like, uh, really scared, right? 2008, I'm like, I don't want to spend money. I don't want to go into debt, all that stuff. And so uh, I put down the $400, non, excuse me, it was a refundable deposit. And before I was going to get on a call with him, I knew the course was going to cost me $2,500 and I'd never spent $2,500 on anything like that. And so I knew it was going to cost me that. So I had two days to go to my network because I had a podcast and I had done all these other things. So I went to my network to think, it, would anybody want this? Can I even talk about this? Can I sell this? And I went to my network. I got three people to get on a call with me to talk about what they were doing in marketing. And luckily this was during launch season, right? January. Mm-hmm. And two of those people said yes to a thousand dollars that they would pay me a thousand dollars for me to build them a conversational chatbot like this. And I didn't even know how to do it yet. And I was honest. I told them, I don't know how to do this, but this is what I'm learning. And I think this is freaking amazing. And they agreed to do that. And so I got on the call with Andrew two days later and I'm like, okay, uh, I've never spent $2,500 on anything in my life. So I'm I'm a little nervous about that. And he's like, well, how about 2000? I went, it's old. I've already got two grand in my pocket. Let's go. And I haven't looked back since. And um, 2020, hung out with Andrew in San Francisco again, because I'm very thankful to uh, call him not exactly a friend. I don't go have dinner at his house, but uh, definitely a, a deeper acquaintance than just a networking acquaintance. And he asked me if I would take over Bot Academy for him. And of course I said, yes. So here we are, but that's my journey to conversations. It basically, it made sense. So I'm not the marketing gal like Mark is, and probably you are, where I'm going to look at data and I'm going to look at all the research on competitive analysis and, and all these other things. That's not what I do. I am creative with the conversation. I get deep into why is this business doing what they do? Who also cares about what they do? And how do we communicate with those people? You're kind of blowing my mind a little bit just because I've never really thought of the conversation as a unit. You're making me think of the conversation as a unit. I do occasionally go deep into like these measurement, I guess, uh, reveries where I'll start to, oh yeah, well, we need to look at this rate and that rate and this rate. And you know, I snap out of it at some point. Marketing is about humans and it's about people. And now that I'm more clearly on the communication side of things, which is really about building trust uh, and reputation and those so-called fluffy things at the top of the funnel, if you believe in the funnel as a, as a construct, you know, and we can go into what's great about the funnel or what is flawed about the funnel. But the fact of the matter is it's still, still a very useful model for, for thinking about how people move through a process, right? You know, it's at that top of it where you're building awareness that conversations really need to happen. You know, we see these conversations all the time in my day job and in whatever business I'm in, which is, you know, you have a position or a point of view on something. You let it be known and people comment on that or respond to that and you just go back and forth and voila, you've got some kind of a conversation going and it could be a very public one and it could be something in a group or in mass. But like I said, I never really thought of that as a constructive unit to get to a sale or to get to a whatever the goal is. So to kind of pull it back to the chatbot thing, right? So a conversation, the um, the chatbots are ways to have conversations with people. But isn't it a little counterintuitive because it's a it's a bot, right? So can you tell me and tell our listeners or educate us about this? Like, how is this 
piece of technology actually having a human conversation? You know, I'm sure, I guarantee you that everyone listening to our voices has experienced a chat bot and they're like, oh, that's a bot. And oh my gosh, it's terrible. They think of it like the decision tree in a voicemail in a call tree, right? Um, It's like, press one for this, press five for that. And you have to wait 10 minutes to get through that process. And I'm just not patient at all with that. So most people who build these bots, that's the way they think of it. They think of it as a means to an end. So I'm going to get a lead. I'm going to give them a PDF or a lead magnet or whatever, all these, all these buzzwords, right? I'm going to give them something they signed up for, and then I'm going to sell them something. And there's really no thought or uh, depth to who is this person? Why are they here? What do they really want? What transformation are they looking in their looking for in their life? What change are they looking? Why are they? What what is this thing that they've just opted in for going to give them at change in their life at all? And how can I help them do those things? They don't get that deep. Most chatbots don't. If we're talking about a conversational bot, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You need to understand that. And I look at that like unsubscribes are not just welcomed. I fish for them. I actually put in my copy, you know, hey, otherwise, if you, anytime you want to unsubscribe, just type the word stop and you'll never hear from me again. I might put a little FOMO in there, right? I might put a little, little thing in there to say, and you'll never get my XYZ amazing thing ever again. I mean, I am a marketer, (laughs) but I'm still going to give them that option to say, you don't want to be here. Go ahead and go. I don't want you here. I would rather have a small list of white hot people that are absolutely my people, whoever this business is, right? My business is people than a huge list of lukewarm any day. Oh, clearly. Well, you said it earlier. You said a six, that was an 80% open rate and a, and a 60% conversion rate. That's crazy talk. Yeah, it is. But I'm sure it's real. Especially then it was 80% open, 60% click through. And that's because each with a chat bot, it's different. If you compare it with email, which is most people, most people, most people do. Mm-hmm. And email is tell. That's all it is, is tell. You're not actually having a conversation. You're just telling them something and then asking them to take action and click a button. There's just one button usually. You don't want to confuse them and give them five different options, right? So usually one conversion, one click through. But in a chat bot, every single conversation, every single button is like a mini yes. Right. It's a micro commitment. And we are, just to set the stage a little bit more here, to because you mentioned the, the dreaded E word, the email. You know, we all deal with it. And I love how in your bio you say that you're, in your bio, you talk about disrupting the email marketing. And that's like, you love doing that. Um, and- you're creating disruption in the email marketing uh, world. When you talk about the bot, so you did say that all of us probably have experienced that chat bot. And we certainly have. I mean, this, the customer service bot that's on any website, <laughs> can it help you? Yep. Then the three dots go and drive you crazy for whatever, however long it takes. You know, I'm like, excuse me, I, gotta, I have to run. Uh, help me. That's not exactly what you're talking about, right? When you talk about the chat bot, you're talking about on via text, via chat, Uh, services? Like, how does it look? Like, how does it work? Give us a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I can give you as much as you want because this is the stuff that is just crazy. So I need to say something though with the future, because when we talk about these chatbots, that's so 2017, right? (laughs) I can can say that because it has uh, transformed tremendously since then. We now do SMS and email and chat. And now I'm actually going into disrupting more of the website space because you can actually have your your website or your online property be conversational. You don't have to just have a static website that has a page that tells you something. The button then takes you to MailChimp opt-in form, and then you get the thing. You can actually have that conversation as part of your web property now. So we're going way into the future of that. And the same thing with like NFTs and Coinbase stuff. I mean, we're, it's going crazy. But the purpose of a chat bot, my kind of chat bot, would be it, the simplest thing that I learned uh, with Messenger specifically. Are companies like ManyChat and ChatFuel and MobileMonkey these are the main ones. I usually work only in many chat. I haven't really worked in mobile monkey. I've talked to Larry Kim, uh, great guy, wonderful product. But once I started with one particular product, I didn't want to have to learn three different chat platforms when they're all really similar. And many chat is set up for marketers. Many chat is a marketer's chat bot. It's not uh, designed for techies. It's designed for marketers. Uh, it has the whole 
interface is is uh, mind map driven, and I'm a mind map kind of gal. Oh, me too. Oh, let's put a pin in that because I'm I love it. Yeah, that's your gig. Then you need to go mind many chat fuel. Just introduce the mind maps uh, system, but there's still a more of a techie based kind of. And I started with chat chat fuel because that's the one that Andrew used when he did his webinar. He showed us how to do a chat bot in chat fuel. So I went and got a free account, started playing around. And that's before the webinar was over. It's like, yeah, I got this. I know how to do this. This is going to be so much fun. But basically, so these conversations are different. They're not just customer service based. They're basically taking people deeper into the conversation, just just like you would anywhere else. So you're going to start with, let's take one of the most common solutions. I work with a lot of course creators or coaches or mastermind people, right? So they're going to have, let's say there's a course creator, one of my clients who she teaches mostly moms how to start an e-commerce store. And so at the top of her funnel, she's going to have, uh, she does Facebook lives and you can actually connect your Facebook page directly to these uh, these chatbots. And so you can actually go live on your Facebook page. Now we're switching a lot to groups now, so I can get into details there. But again, we're keeping it to the purpose of the, of the chatbot. So you can go live on your Facebook page, let's say, and you can tell people, you know, hey, I'm going to talk to you about the 15 biggest business mistakes I've ever made and how to avoid them. But you know what? Don't worry about taking notes. I got you covered. Because when you comment on this post, I'll give you the PDF version of exactly what I'm going to talk about in Messenger. And so you keep their attention on the conversation. They don't have to worry about it. When they comment, automatically Messenger's going to pop up and give them a PDF. So I give them the PDF automatically. They comment saying, wow, this is cool. Messenger, and this is on the Facebook page, right? Messenger pops up, says, oh, I'm so glad you think it's cool. Here's the PDF version of this talk that I just did. And they download it. The bot waits for 30 seconds. It's all automated, right? So the bot will wait for 30 seconds. They know when that person got the PDF delivered. 30 seconds goes by, the bot kicks back in and says, hey, if you liked that, would you like last week's PDF? Because the bot knows whether this person got last week's PDF or not. Mm -hmm. The person either says yes or no. Here again is a micro commitment. You give them a yes or a no. If they click yes, then the bot comes back with, great, here you go. And it's last week's PDF. You know, the the six uh, software tools I can't live without in my business. They download that. The bot's going to wait another 30 seconds. Now it's going to come in and say, you know what? While you're looking at that, you'll probably like this training that I did where I show you how my two daughters sold $100,000 worth of scarves in nine months. And my daughters were only 10 and 13. If they can do it, you can do it. Would you like to see this free training? So do you see, we started with this free PDF, generic stuff, business building. Now we're getting deeper into it. And they say, whoa, are you kidding? Yes. Again, yes or no. And they go, yes. And now I can get deeper in. Great. I'd love to show you. Are you brand new to business? So I hear I'm segmenting. Are you brand new to business or do you already have a business and you're looking to scale it? Right. So then I can get them to decide and self-declare. And then I'm going to send them to a evergreen webinar. This is the funnel that's been constructed. This is it. Yep. And, you know, you're building this decision tree based on a mind map. Correct. Right. And as people go down, you just, you're just offering the choice. It's not really like a conversation at this point so much as like a decision tree, right? Like choose yes or choose no. But I can ask them questions and I can have them give me data. And I can use keywords. And when they type in certain keywords, then it'll trigger other flows. So we can get a little more complicated than just a a simple decision tree, but it's not AI. We're not training an artificial intelligence here. It is infant AI, barely even sitting up in a high chair, right? It's just program. Correct. But the copy I put in that, I have to speak in her voice because I want them to relate to what I'm talking about. So she says things like she loves uh, Laffy Taffy, right? That's one of the things she loves. Her hashtag is because I can. She's from Salt Lake City, very down to earth, very approachable, doesn't mind making mistakes, doesn't mind saying the wrong things, not finding her words. I'm going to use her vernacular. I'm going to use her slang and I'm going to have that conversation. So automatically people are feeling more comfortable having this conversation and clicking the buttons or giving me data or giving me information. And they know they're, they're interacting with a bot. Oh yeah, we have to, by law. I live in California. California has a law that you can't pretend that a bot is a human. Yeah, which means everybody has that law because any company that wants to do business, there's no borders like that. So, okay. So I think it's very fascinating, first of all, because we've all interacted with these things. And as you said, I remember going to social media marketing world a couple of years ago. Like what, it, might, made been, it might've been 19, the first one, where I was first exposed to, and I believe it was many chat, actually. I think I have the t-shirt to prove it. Octopus, is that them? 
Oh yeah, Mike Young. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I wear that shirt sometimes, and people are like, "What's that?" I know. I don't know. <laughs> but now I know. You're like, um, I don't know. <laughs> but now I do. I've always thought that the idea of being able to just kind of have these micro conversations on a platform that really is where the customer or the consumer chooses to engage, because we don't choose to engage in email, right? That's not normally the place where we would choose to engage. It's like you get out of email to go someplace else to do something. Whereas, you know, if it's on your phone or if you're a Facebook person, if it's in your Facebook chat, I suppose there's certain ways this could integrate with almost any chat platform. I'm digging into this because what I'm wondering is, where does the human take over, right? And also, how can this potentially apply to those more, those higher level, like not qualitatively higher level, but I mean, conversations that have to happen around purpose and around cause. And is it possible? Like, and so maybe maybe the human has to jump in sooner in that case, but I don't know. It's just, bubbling around in my head. Where does the human pop in? Let's let's go there. Really good place to go. Yeah, because that obviously depends on the business, right? It depends on what you're doing, what you're selling, what conversation, what relationship you're trying to develop. So I have some clients like this one who sells uh, this course is a $997 course. It's a DIY course. So you can just buy it and take it at your, at your leisure. She has a Facebook group. So she follows up with people in the Facebook group. So that thing, she just goes straight to a landing page. She doesn't have to, human just doesn't have to be involved in that process at all. And so from that perspective, here's the data that I get, because in her situation, I stay at the top of the funnel. So it took us 2.8 times of people watching a live, downloading the PDF, watching the webinar next week, watching the live, download the PDF, go to the webinar third week, right? So 2.8 of those before people purchased. On an average, it took 2.8 times. So at that top of the funnel, there's no human has to be involved at that price point because they're getting to know her already. They've seen her on a live. They see who she is. She is who she is. She talks the same in the bot. And they're like, okay, I trust. I know she's going to do what I need to do. I'm just going to buy it. So I have others who maybe sell a $11,000 uh, training program on how to, how to market your real estate company, right? That's not, that's going to need a human pretty early in the process. We can still qualify people. We can still give them these free things. We can do all that, but it's going to lead to an appointment. So this gal that I did the 997 course who sells the course for e-commerce through that chat bot in 2018, I was able to, to make her with no Facebook ads at all, just that process, a million dollars in sales in 99 days. Jeez. Yeah. We pause there, not because we have nothing to say, but because we're actually like, our listeners aren't going to see this, but we're like looking at each other going, whoa, you know, <laughs> that's pretty astounding. Yeah. <laughs> I was totally floored with that too. And that case study basically got me on stage at the MediChat conference, at the Conversations Conference. It's called Conversations Conference. And so then you go into other programs. I've helped e-commerce stores. I've helped higher level coaches, uh, SaaS programs, all kinds of, uh, there are accounting, you know, CPAs, uh, lawyers, finance, uh, all of it. It really depends on the product you're selling or the personality, the brand, all those things and price point and how long the sales cycle is, how much do they need to know, like, and trust you before they'll buy from you. And anything over about a thousand dollar purchase, like a course and things like that usually is going to take a human to sell it. So you're going to need to go to an appointment and get somebody to show up on a call. Well, that makes sense. And, and I have to say, like, you know, I have been known to purchase things through without any human interaction whatsoever, upwards of close to that amount, I'm going to ask, pose, um, especially during the pandemic. Like some folks might say, you got suckered into things. Some folks would say, no, you just discovered some really interesting ways that good products are being marketed to you. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. <laughs> There's people out there, you know, I've seen the click funnels, you know, I know why everything's, every price point ends in a seven. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> yes. it's kind of funny. You said nine hundred ninety-seven dollars. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds. That's exactly right. You got it. She's a, she's in the ClickFunnels inner circle. You bet. <laughs> that's right. You know, what always bothered me about the typical ClickFunnels thing is amount of repetitive and redundant copy you have to go through when you scroll down these websites are like forever and ever. Like, oh, crying out loud! I'll just just where's that convert button? Then it would get me sometimes go the uh, complete opposite way. Or like you've told me seven times already, right? Yeah, that's not a conversation. That's not a conversation. Obviously. Yeah. You know, that's really, you're sucked into the funnel. And look, I know it works. 
it works for like brilliantly um, and probably works less now than it did two years ago. But, you know, but the whole idea of actually, you know, interacting and answering questions. I mentioned this on my podcast a while back. I don't know if my listeners will remember, but I was, I think, the victim of a nefarious chatbot not too long ago, last year, where I had been contacted for a recruitment issue. Like somebody had said, I have this great job for you. And it seemed so legit. MK, I can't, I can't tell you, like they had to the point where, I guess, you know, in retrospect, it's like, hey, look at my LinkedIn profile. You can get some things, right? It's pretty clear. And I, I'm an open book. I've been on social media since I've been on LinkedIn since what, 2003. Like whenever it started, that's when I, yeah, member 65,000. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's true. It's my, it's my one claim of fame, which I've never gotten anything from. Oh man. I, not even a certificate. I think I, had, I, I would love a certificate LinkedIn if you're listening. But these guys knew, like they knew, and and they what it was was they said, okay, there's one chat where I would I went through this chat back and forth, and it was brilliantly done, where they're asking baseline recruitment questions, and the baseline recruitment questions. Now that you're talking about how you know the 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 decision tree and the mind map, I can understand like certain keywords would set things off, right? And it would be like you know so whatever that initial screening interview. And I'm like, okay, if this is legit, this is a brilliant way to screen candidates using a well constructed chat bot to screen candidates, I'm all for it. Yeah. Right. At the end of the first thing, I got a text that said, okay, tomorrow at noon or one o'clock or we choose the time, somebody will contact you and we're going to chat for, around the next stage of this. Cause like your answers were, you passed the screening. So I did that. And then the next phase, the questions got deeper, right? Like really deep. And then like three quarters of the way through, I'm like, wait a second here. I am, they're like really trying to build my identity. Like, I just got the sense that if this is not a legit job thing, they're getting enough information out of me to be able, probably, if it's a sophisticated AI, to pretend to be me. And then like, you know, it went all the way through and I I started just kind of like, I was, by this point, I, I had to see it to the end, but I wasn't being as, as truthful with my answers as I, as I would have been. And in the end, they're like, congratulations, you got the job. <laughs> wait a minute. I'm like, wait, wait. When do I start? <laughs> but it was really scary. It was scary. I'll tell you that I immediately unplugged everything I had. I just, I ran all kinds of cleaning software, you know, and I'm like, suck. I'm like, I'm like, what a moron. I felt like such an idiot because I, I know better than this. I mean, I talk about this kind of stuff. I know better. I had to, you know, I speak with cyber experts all the time. So anyway, but that was a chat bot, right? And I know it can go anyway. Like there's, there's positive uses for any technology and negative uses for any technology, but yes, my goodness. But the stuff that you're doing sounds great. Same with marketers. I mean, this whole, this whole concept with many chat and all of that. I mean, the marketers got in there, not the marketers. I don't want to group everybody, well, but the not so ethical marketers got in there and just spammed the hell out of people and didn't care at all. And just did the whole click funnels thing of, I just want to sell as much as I can. I want to get this two comma club award, you know, this million dollar award and just sell, sell, sell. They basically, because of that, Facebook started putting rules on it and saying, you can't send messages outside of 24 hours. You can't send promotional messages, blah, blah, blah. They're kind of starting to walk that back a little bit, but, uh, but it got really, really hairy. And uh, it basically ruined it for the rest of us. This is incredible tool. It ruined it on, on Facebook because this is a Facebook bot. We've got Instagram now, but now we're going into, into the whole conversation on your website. I mean, you don't need, when you said the particular app, um, I work with a, uh, I put my products now and my clients now on a, a program that doesn't require an app. So in other words, you don't have to log into WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook or Telegram or, you know, any of the, or LinkedIn or anything like that, you can have that conversation independent of app. It's basically done by, with a, an internet connection, just a browser. You just have a browser. It's just actually all internet based. So you just open up a browser and you can start having that conversation. That's handy. Oh my goodness. Not only that, <laughs> I am so fired up about this because not only that, Facebook doesn't own your data anymore. You can actually own your own data. Oh, well, hallelujah to that. Because Facebook totally controls that, right? You don't, I don't have anything. Facebook has the subscriber. I don't, <laughs> right? So uh, I can gather some of that data, but I've got to quick get it off of off Messenger as quickly as I can because Facebook also is schizophrenic and they might shut me down for no reason. Yeah. And which I've had happen. Yeah. I have a, it's called God Quotes, this bot. And when they, when they hired me in beginning of 2018, they had, I think, 12,000 subscribers in their bot, okay? I got them up to 2.2 million. 
by the time uh, Facebook shut us down in April of 2019. And uh, they said we weren't following terms of service, which of course we were, but they didn't like us. So 2.2 million people, we can't communicate with them at all because Facebook shut it down. To be judged against the terms of service by the likes of Facebook should be a badge of honor by this point, I think. So I have a distinct honor of every single one of my clients has had that happen <laughs> in 2020. <laughs> because 2020, oh my God. the election and the pandemic, I mean, it was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. They were shutting everybody down. Well, I mean, and this this is kind of, so I, I wanted to kind of circle back a little bit here because there's a couple things that just keep popping back to me. And there's a lot of technology out there that it seems like you're grappling with changes in the landscape and changes in, in you know, the platforms that allow it or don't allow it. By, by making a browser-based, then you don't care about any of that stuff anymore, which is fantastic, right? People can own their own stuff. Somebody said way earlier, which is that it was about the copy. When you write the bots, like anybody could have a bot, but actually, unless you're speaking in the voice of the person. So ultimately it's a creative exercise. Oh my gosh. Yes. Just coming back to where we started a little bit, um, it's that creativity and that creation. So people might wonder, how is this a creative thing? But it's totally creative. So you're copywriting all the time. That's exactly what I'm doing. It's, it's constant copywriting. You need to think about persona and voice and you're writing and you're speaking in someone else's voice. So the best employee I've ever hired for this was an actor. She was an actor it clicked immediately. She knew how to take on that persona and write from that person's perspective. I think of this, the way I look at writing copy, because that was the first course I did back in 2017, was the chatbot copywriting course. And that specifically, the way I look at it, I call it face tweet. You're basically speaking like you're on Facebook, but you're doing it in the structure of Twitter. So it's face tweet. All right, because you have to be very limited. Very limited. Okay. You're not necessarily limited. There's lots of lots of bots out there. I got to be honest with you. The mobile monkey bot was one of the worst offenders of my, and my pet peeve is a huge long post, a huge long message sent to me that I've got to scroll up in my phone and start from the top and read. And then by the time I'm halfway through, they've sent me another message. So it scrolls it all up again. So I got to go back into, oh my gosh, that drives me bonkers. That is my pet peeve. I'm, I'm going to leave that bot immediately. So you can, you can do that. You can make a long copy, but you might as well do that in email. Don't do that in chat. That's what email's for. All right. So go do an email. That's it. So when you're looking at that, that's why I, when I teach it, it's, it's face tweet. You're on Facebook and you're communicating if, as if you're on Facebook, but you're doing it Twitter-like. So I usually put, it, I'm an old school Twitter, right? I don't even do Twitter anymore, but 140 characters when I started, right? So I added a few more. I'm like, all right, make each text block 160 characters. And so what you have to do is you're not a novelist anymore. Save that for your email. Now you're a short story writer. You're a poet. Yeah. It's hard. It is hard to write less. Not only is it hard to write less than that amount, how do you stay compelling? So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the great Park Howell on my show. And um, I don't know if you know Park. I've heard the name, yes. Certainly another SMMW denizen. But Park is about the business of story. He talks about the, the ABT, the end but therefore method of, of storytelling. And it's, it's just, it's a great formula that just describes your classic setup, controversy, and then resolution. To do that in 160 characters is totally possible, but it takes a lot of skill. Yes. But remember, we have the opportunity to have, we're not just telling this story. We're inviting them into the story to participate. So when I'm telling a story, I might, the way I do it with this face tweet thing, I take it, let's say somebody's email. So I take their email and you're going to have that process in an email, right? You're going to have a beginning. They're going to start telling the story. It's going to have a climax and then it's going to have a resolution and they're going to ask them to, you know, have a conversion, a click, right? Click through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can take that copy and I'm going to break it down. First thing I'm going to do is take it and, and break it down into one paragraph, keeping the essence of what they're trying to say. Make it one paragraph. Take out all the extraneous stuff and put it into one paragraph. Then I'm going to ask you to take it and break it down in, in the essence of this whole long thing. Break, put it into one sentence. Whatever you're trying to say, one sentence. And then I'm even going to go further and say, now, what is the one word? that basically represents what this email is trying to say. So for this client that I talked about, with the because I can and the e -com, I took her process and basically her word is because I can, right? It's the hashtag because I can. 
or belief. It's basically believing in yourself. So once you do that, you can wrap your brain around anything and train yourself to take that huge long copy and distill it down. And then once you do that, you understand, but now you can go back to the original long message and you can start crafting an adventure. It it really is like a choose your own adventure book. So you can take that huge copy and you can start with the beginning and and you're going to do more leading statements and questions, not just telling. So you're not going to say, so you want to make more money because you want to help your kids uh, have a buy school school clothes this this coming fall, right? I mean, that's pretty generic and standard. You're not just going to go right and then have a yes or no. You want to structure that sentence into, isn't it crazy when you sit down at the, at the kitchen counter and you're doing, you're, you're balancing your checkbook and you're so frustrated that here we go, school clothes shopping's coming. And of course I'm going longer than 160 characters here, but I would do school shopping's coming. Aren't you just tired of having to try and figure out how you're going to scrape together the money? Yes or no, right? Have you tried any of these things and give them options, right? Have you tried eBay? Have you tried Etsy? Have you tried those kinds of things and give them those? So they're, they're getting deeper into the conversation to give me a little bit of data without me asking them for personal information, right? And so you're going to take that story and you're going to break that down. And I can, you mentioned the three little dots a minute ago. That's my friend, right? I don't want more than say three of those. I don't want to deliver a block of text, have those three little dots like I'm typing deliver a block of text, three little dots, one more block of text. I want some interaction. I don't want them to just read because again, then I can just send them an email. So I've got to have something within that framework to ask them to participate and click a button and do something. Give me some information or at least tell me you're here and you're, you're paying attention and you're participating in the conversation. You're just breaking it up, but you don't want to just take your email, break it up into chunks and stick it in a bot. You have to do it in a much more conversational way so that it makes sense when you ask a question instead of just tell that they're going to answer by clicking a button. Yeah, it's a translation. You're translating it into another language. You're taking an email and you're translating it into a chatbot language. It's the the same thing that, you know, I try to always, when I work with agencies or when I work with younger staffers or when I work with freelance writers, they have specialties, they have things that they do. But, you know, somebody who's really great at writing a long form article isn't necessarily wonderful at writing a social post. Distilling down that article to the social post, those are very different medium. It's a different skill set. Everybody could do both if you're a good writer. You just have to train yourself to learn. But you know, it's it's still different things. And people think that, oh, you can just cut and paste and make it happen. And it just, it doesn't work that and way. And really the purpose of this, to be honest with you, the best thing you can do is uh, remember that, yes, we're talking about chatbots. Yes, we're talking about technology. Yes, we're talking about cool things that are going to automatically happen. It's all automation. But it's not the bot that makes this marketing campaign good. It's what you put in it just like anything else. It's not the email, the fact that we can send emails and if they click this button, then they're going to get this email. But if they didn't click, then they're going to get this email. It's not just that. The bot is, it's more important than the tech. It's what you put in it. It's what you say. It's how you use it. It's what the, what the purpose is and what you say to this person and have them participate. I get so many people that really are hot with the technology and they're just, oh my gosh, it's so cool and it's great. But then they just create junk. It's just a bot, just to, just to have a bot, just to have an automation. Miss marketers who come and ruin everything like Mark says, you know, it's, it's true, you know, but you talk about the technology, you talk about the bot. What should we think about that? What should we be thinking about the dreaded AI and the way that the tech is going? Is there anything that you see in the future of this that's keeping you up at night? Yeah, there's all kinds of things uh, that could be keeping me up at night. Uh, I choose not to let them because number one, I don't have any control. <laughs> Unless I'm going to actually go in there and and become an AI, uh, you know, person to actually create these things. I mean, I play in AI all the time. What do you think the algorithms are on uh, in Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn? Those are all AI. So I can't control that. So yeah, there's lots that can keep me up at night. But the way I look at AI, it's still very rudimentary. There's still not a lot in terms of conversations. It's still not a lot that it actually uh, artificially can be more human. The most fun I've had in a in playing with AI is a new tool that I'm using uh, that I just love. It's so fun. It's called conversion.ai. And have you heard of this? Nope. Okay. This is this is really fun stuff. So it this is actually copy written by AI. This bot, they call him, this AI is named Jarvis. 
He has a personality because his creators have given him a personality. He's been trained on about 10% of the internet. So he's been, you know, artificial intelligence. He's been trained and uh, understands he's consumed maybe a 10% of the internet. And so you can go in and you can, you can put in your business name, your product description, kind of start doing a description. You can say how you want to speak. Do you want to be funny? Do you want to be professional? Do you want to be dry? Do you want to be snarky? You know, any, you can put how you're going to speak and then you hit create or something. I don't remember what the button says. And Jarvis will give you three different scenarios or five, however many you tell him of what you're asking for. So if it's a Facebook ad headline, if it's a, the sub headline in your website, if it's a Facebook ad copy, if it's a blog post, you can actually write long form content. People have actually written books, nonfiction books with Jarvis. I would never just give it to the AI and say, it's fine. A human's still going to have to go in and check it and do things. Yeah, of course. But this makes your copywriting so much faster because he comes up with things that you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. And then you can take that and put it back in the bot and have him further develop it. It is so fun. I'm having a blast with it. But that's the deepest AI I have connected with. That sounds like a very positive. Oh, completely. Yeah. Yeah. I work with, um, I do like transcripting, you know, using like I use Otter AI, but there, there's a whole lot of them out there. And I love it. I think it's great service. And I always laugh when um, it gets- <laughs> Some of the stuff. It hears something that's not quite there. I know. <laughs> some of the stuff they come Man. up with, you're like, hmm, where'd that come from? Yeah, I might take some of those out and just make those quote cards for, you know, and 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 just, you know, my guess would kill me if that happened. But, you know, so the future for MK and like, where are you going with this? And, and what do you think's next? Well, I, I'm not going to be a big, uh, you know, go totally DeFi on you, but uh, but I'm telling you that's the next. I'm getting approached for, for some pretty incredible projects that are using crypto and NFTs to do some pretty amazing things with climate and artists. And uh, we're, we're talking to the extent of looking at giving the ownership to the farmer, let's say. Let's say there's a coffee bean uh, farmer. And uh, instead of Microsoft coming and buying up the land so that they can say, well, here, we're offsetting our carbon production by buying this particular piece of property so that we can make sure that these trees stay there so that we offset the carbon that we're emitting, right? All that stuff. It actually, with NFTs and things like that, they, you can actually give that ownership to the farmer and have the farmer prove with satellite data and everything that they have organic practices. They're not spraying pesticides. Their soil health is a certain level. Their plant health health is a certain level. So they can basically prove that they own the carbon offset of some of these companies. And so we're trying to help with the marketing of those kinds of products and projects so that we can also raise money for some of these causes. And when you talk about conversations, this group of people is Gen X, Gen Z, they're the young guys, right? The youngest I've heard so far of someone who's building in the in the metaverse is 12. And uh, so far, I think there was one guy that's talking about it at seven, but I haven't actually seen. He's a seven-year-old. And and these, these kids that are building in Minecraft, right? Sure. They're taking those skills and building in the metaverse so that, you know, people can go buy property in there and walk around with their Gucci handbag and it's all digital. It's second life, right? Second life. That's right. My gosh. Don't even want to think about the negative. You want to talk about keeping me up at night. That's a possibility, but I'm not going there. <laughs> but but marketing in that, think about it. That community speaks completely different from me. They're on Discord. They're on Twitter. They're on Discourse. They're on these other platforms that are not my platforms, but they speak completely differently, but they are all about community and they can smell a marketer coming a mile away. Oh yeah. They do not like marketers. They do not, you, you come out with anything thinking you're going to sell anything and they're gone. They scatter, scatter like rats and they turn roaches when you turn on the light, right? I'm not saying they're roaches. Please forgive me. It's okay. We've said worse here. <laughs> but yeah, this, and so the conversation there needs to build huge trust you have to be true to your authentic self. You can't just be trying to market. You need to have a cause that they believe in and actually do good because these people are saying, I hate gas guzzling cars, but I also hate Teslas because the batteries are terrible. So I'm going to walk. 
I'm like, well, so I have no choice. I, I've got to drive. Which one do you want me to do? I don't care. They're both terrible. Just walk. I'm like, well, that's really not an option. So I do need to get from here to there and I can't walk to New York. Yeah. So I'm going to have to spend some fuel somewhere. Right. But that's their mindset. You're ruining the planet just by getting up every day. Right. So the community that you can help build through marketing is crazy amazing. And the conversations are really interesting. That's, and, and just like, you know, we've learned uh, from, the uprising and from Mark's books and just from just being out there, you, they are in charge. We are not in charge. Marketers are not in charge. The customers and the communities are in charge. They have to discover the things that they love. And then that, those things, those services, those missions, those causes, those products will be the ones that hit. You know, it's up to us to make them discoverable and relatable, which is a really different job than marketers had uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah. And that's why I'm so drawn to Mark, really. That's the purpose. When when, when the Marketing Rebellion, uh, when I first listened to it in audiobook, it was like, yes, this is exactly where I want to go. I agree 100%. And since then, I've just embraced this whole path, this whole adventure, and just jumped in with both feet and had a blast. Yeah. I'm glad that you did. It sounds like it, Marketing Rebellion in particular really inspired you and, and helped you with your business. Mark will be glad to hear all this. I hope Mark listens and hears us, but... Uh, uh, you know, he's a busy guy. I haven't read Cumulative Advantage yet, Mark. Obviously, if you're listening, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, it'll happen. I listened to it. It's amazing. You listened to it? Yes, I did. That counts. You know, that totally counts. I've got it. I'm like, you know, 30 pages in. But I am just, you know, look, I'm first. I, I'm, I'm pleased as punch to be part of that community. And that's that's a great community to be part of. But I, it means that I get to meet people like you, MK, and, and have people like you on my show. And we talk about cool stuff. I mean... My whole, you know, kind of shtick here is is about curiosity and exploration and fascinating people and fascinating stories. And you check all those boxes for me. I mean, look, I didn't know if I was going to, where we were going to go with the conversation. And I knew I was interested in, in bots, but I, I didn't realize how deep I wanted to know about the stuff. And thank you for indulging me and for indulging our audiences. Thank you for letting me run at the mouth because this stuff is just so fascinating to me. It's just the beginning. Yeah. And you're so passionate about it. And this is what we need. We need people who understand these technologies and aren't going to like take advantage of little, you know, little old ladies, or I don't mean to, I don't mean to stereotype like that, but you know, people who are, who are not really, you know, equipped to deal with this kind of stuff. So on that note, I am so grateful that you are here. I, I want uh, my listeners, our listeners to go find you at um, messengerfunnels.com is one of the places. You can go to messengerfunnels.com. You could go to botacademy.com. Yes, those are the main two. Yeah. Yeah. You can look for uh, for MK at um, on LinkedIn and her name will be spelled properly in the uh, title of this episode, Mary Catherine Johnson. Otherwise, is there any place else that are you, are you on the Twitters? Are you doing other things like that? Yeah. Yeah, I am. But I, my, actually my latest podcast I'm doing with my son, my 23 year old son, he was the, the first publisher of my first, this same podcast, the first generation called Parent Entrepreneur Power. Oh, good. And uh, now we're doing this together, helping parents uh, model and foster entrepreneurship for their kids as an option for their kids to use for success. Because both of my boys started their businesses through my business. That's my passion now. I'm, uh, he and I are talking to people and uh, talking about how parents are using their their entrepreneurial uh, skills to help grow their kids' uh, success potential. Oh, that's like taking financial literacy to a whole new level. And it's so, it sounds like a great time. So amazing. The Parent Entrepreneurial Power Podcast. I suppose you can find that anywhere podcasts are. Anywhere podcast. Mark's going to be on. I'm going to interview. Uh, my son and I are going to interview Mark next week. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. great. Good for you. That's a great, that's a, he's going to, he's a great, he's just a great guy. He's such a sweetheart. I just, I reached out. I'm like, well, I don't know if you'll have time because you know, these guys are busy. I don't know if you'll have time, but I would love for you to share your knowledge because his daughter works with him and, and his son has a business and he's like, yeah, this is my passion. I'll, I'll definitely do it. So. It's one thing to say, hey, will you be on my show? I got nothing really to offer just apart from some people who are going to hear you. But if you're like, if you really have the cause that he believes in um, and anybody does. But listen, MK, I've really loved this conversation. I hope someday you'll come back, but I look forward to seeing you at the next up uprising and continuing the conversation. 
because as we know, it's all about conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Dan. I really, I know we're going to have more conversations offline, regardless of where we're, whether we're going to meet at a conference. Uh, we will definitely stay connected because I've had a blast and uh, love what you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.